I want to welcome you to worship for our first online worship at the United Church of Sandwich. I'm glad that you are able to join us. We are reminded today that the church is not a building. The church is the people. And we will continue to be the church, continue to be a family, continue to be the body of Christ for as long as we need to in the world until the day we can come back and worship together as a community in this building. I ask that as you are in, uh, engaging in worship with us to post in the comments of the video, to share your thoughts, to share your questions, to share your ideas, to share your prayers. If you have a joy or a concern, share it and we will be praying for you today and this week. Please contact us during the office hours from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. anytime this week, or you may call my cell phone or email us if you need anything. We are here to be for you, be there for you in prayer, in presence as we are able to, and if there are basic supplies and necessities that you need and you are unable or are or, or not comfortable going to the store, we have volunteers who can get those supplies to your doorstep. Let us begin in an attitude of prayer as we engage in worship. Good morning. Please pray with me and bow your heads. We are not people of fear, we are people of courage. We are not people who protect our own safety, we are people who protect our neighbor's safety. We are not people of greed, we are people of generosity. We are your people, God, giving and loving wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. Now let us pray together, as the Lord has taught us to pray, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. At worship at United Church of Sandwich, we always take a few minutes every worship service to have a children's time, a time where we can share the message on a level in which we're to gather them together. I have my kids with me, and I want to bring my kids up to help lead us in the children's time. And I have a couple of objects here. Now, my kids are going to help me on this. My, my youth is going to be my helper. Owen, I've got Eli here. And Anna, if you want to come, what is this? Bag of rocks. It's a bag of rocks. I want you to imagine that this is you. See all these rocks here? Yep. These are different things that are in life that we have to deal with. Now, look right here. See these bigger rocks? Yep. These are important things. What's something that's important to us? Um, Legos. Legos. That, that may be, but also that may be a small rock too. How about family? Yeah. yeah. Friends. Here. Friends, your friends. What else is really important? God, oh, you gave the right answer. See this really shiny one right here? Ooh. This is God. You want to hold that? And I'm going to say our pets are important, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say helping others are important. Who wants to hold another rock? Anna? Any other thing that's important? Um, trying to holidays? Well, yeah, important. spending time with our family on those important holidays, yes. Now, this is you. Can you guys please put your, the things that are important in your life in the bag? They're, oh, see, they don't really fit, does it? Look, now look at Anna. Let's put God in the bag. Is God fitting? See? Right now in our lives, there's a lot of things that we're dealing with. And they can fill up all these small things or things that can fill up our lives to the point where we can't fit God in the bag. And we can't fit the important things in the bag. So what we need to do, if we're going to 
have things that matter in our lives, Owen, this is how we should be. Now, if we put other things in first, God won't fit. What if we put God in? Owen, we put God in, God fits. Now, what if we put the things that are important? They still fit, right? And we can add, if there's important things in our lives, only, one, only do a couple, all the important things. Now, if we do that, guess what? The other stuff, we can pour that afterwards, and look, it fits. Everything still fits. But only if we put God in our lives first. We put God first, and then we put our family and our friends and helping others, and then all the other stuff can go around it. But if we try to do that first, God will never fit in our lives. So can we say a prayer? Anna? Dear God, in a time like today, when there's a lot of worry and there's a lot of struggle that's in the world, help us to understand our priorities, to put God first, to let God's love be there for those in our lives, our family and our friends and our community. And after we have put God first and put the people in our lives that God has put us second, let our lives then be filled up with the other things. We thank you for all that you do. And we say, amen. 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 Thank you. You guys can have a seat. I would like to invite you to be in an attitude of prayer and presence as we have a gift of special music. this time we'll be doing our scripture readings. Our first scripture comes from Mark chapter 1 verses 9 through 15. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believeth good news. Our second reading also comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 24. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, 
They were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. The man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, they immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood. He answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. We're traveling through the journey of Lent. And today, more than any time before, we really do feel like we are in the wilderness. But as we go through today and this week and, and the struggles and trials that we are facing, I'm reminded of a, another time of doubt I experienced. And that was when my kids were young and Kim and I have close friends in North Carolina. And we were taking a trip down to see them. And while we were going, we knew that Interstate 40... The quickest, easiest, safest way to get to them had been closed because of a rock slide. Well, we had left on a Sunday after church and didn't get started until 1 p.m. So by the time we got to that area, it was well after midnight. And instead of taking the highway, we had to at one point get off and take smaller roads through the mountain. I am thankful it was dark because if it had been daylight, we would have seen at parts that the right side of the road was a cliff and the left side of the road was a cliff from time to time. But we kept going. I can't tell you how much doubt crept into my heart and mind as I was driving that road. We weren't seeing gas stations anymore. Were we going to have enough to make it, or were we going to be stranded? Were we going the right way? We didn't have GPS at the time. We were relying on paper maps in pitch blackness outside. At one point, I turned on the radio and hit scanned, and the numbers just kept cycling through. We could not find even a radio station to have a signal get to us in between the mountains. We made it safe and fine. It was an adventure for us, but I would lie if I said doubt wasn't in my mind that trip. That's the thing about doubt. It's an ever-present part of our life. Except in the church, we often dismiss this notion of doubt. We often act like if you are a person who has doubt, that you are a person of immature faith. That a good Christian shouldn't ever doubt about anything when it comes to God. Makes me think about when we've all gone through our teenage years. When as we are transitioning from a child into an adult, during the teenage years, we, our eyes are opened to a new and more complex world. And we struggle to understand it. And so we often grab on to notions of black and white. That it has to be this way or that way. One or the other. And if we can't, and we can't see the nuances to understand. You ever have a hard time trying to reason with the teenager? It's not easy. Because things must be either left or right. 
But as adults, we know that life is so messy and complicated and nuanced. And so we embrace doubt not as something that is a problem, but as something that is a journey for us. We look back at the first scripture passage that was read. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, it was one line, but I don't know if you caught it. It said, and then he went to Galilee to begin his ministry right after his cousin John had been imprisoned. Doubt is not a sin. And so I very much believe Jesus experienced doubt himself. Doubt can cause sin in our lives, but doubt as an emotion is a part of what it means to be human. Now imagine you're Jesus, and you've gone into the desert to be tempted and tested to prepare for your ministry. And the person who had led the way for you, your older cousin John, was now in prison and would soon be killed. I'm sure Jesus struggled with doubt. And the power of who he is is not that he didn't doubt, but that in the midst of doubt, he overcame. And so, I want you to see doubt not as a problem. Because as the 20th century theologian said, faith is the state of being ultimately concerned. And isn't that what doubt is a part of? Doubt is what concerns us, what worries us. And so when you have doubt in your faith, it is not showing that you have no faith. It is showing that you have an active faith. Apathy is the opposite of faith. Doubt is a sign of a growing faith. So today, as you are facing worry about what's happening in the world, worry about your health or the health of people who are close to you, worry about your business, your job, your finances, worry about the future, your children, your grandchildren, as you're facing doubt of what tomorrow will bring, I say to you, you're okay. Your doubt is okay. Don't let anyone tell you or that you've made a mistake in your doubt. It is part of the experience. It's part of the journey, but it is never the destination. How is your doubt today? Jesus was in his ministry preaching, healing, teaching, and in the midst of it, a father with a son who was gravely ill came to him. Please heal my son. And you know what that father said? I believe, help my unbelief. In the midst of his struggle, he accepted that he had doubt and he pushed forward. Doubt will cause you to do a few things. It could cause you to be like Adam and Eve who tried to take control of their lives, eat of the fruit. We don't need God. We can be like our God ourselves. Doubt can cause you to sin. Doubt can cause you to be like the King Saul who although he followed God, eventually turned away from God. His doubt caused him to go into another direction, to lose faith. Or doubt can cause you to accept that even in your belief, there's struggles. I believe, help my unbelief. Be honest with yourself and your faith. Let that honesty Cause you to ask the hard questions. Cause you to search for the answers. Or at the very least, search for the one who has the answers. Doubt can be a great place 
to find God. But as you doubt, I want to ask you today to don't go that path alone. We are facing a, a term called social distancing. We're asking people in our state, Illinois, to shelter in place. And many parts of the country are doing the same. And even if you're not, we're asking you to separate at least six feet from the people around you. To try not to get too close so that germs are not spread, so that the virus is not passed. And this is a ripe field for what we call social isolation. Where you are separated from family, friends, community. Right now it's so much harder to be community than it has been in a long time. But we can be community. Because when you have doubts, that is the very time in which you need people around you. Think of the Apostle Thomas. Whose great failing, how he got the name Doubting Thomas, came not from his doubts, but came from the fact that he had separated himself from his community when the resurrection happened. But when he returned, his profession of faith, my Lord and my God, and he never again separated himself. His community helped him push through any doubts. I think about Mary and Martha. Martha, who didn't understand her faith as she's in the kitchen working, complaining that her sister was at Jesus' feet. But it was that relationship with her sister that helped Martha push beyond her doubts so that when their brother Lazarus had died, it is Martha who goes to Jesus, still doubting. If you'd only been here, maybe you could have helped, but I know you are God. And even in the midst of her doubt, Martha reached out to Jesus. I know it was Mary's influence that helped Martha do that. I think of my life. I have many gifts and skills, but I know one of my big weaknesses is my pessimistic nature. My often ability to look at the worst. It's all a result of my doubt. And my doubt is just a result of my fear because if I focus on the worst, then I can't be disappointed when it happens. But I've got a wife. I've got friends, and I've got a church family that is around me that often helps me to push beyond that doubt, to see the hope, to live the hope, to not be so pessimistic. And that is a growing edge on my part. But my family and friends support me. Don't isolate yourself. Also, remember, doubt can be a valuable tool to bring you closer to God, but only if you carry through the darkness. Any time on that trip, I could have stopped and said, we can't find our way. I could have turned around. We kept going. And so I want to think, have you think about the founder of the United Methodist Church of the Methodist Movement, John Wesley. John Wesley was a prodigy of the faith, a child of a pastor himself who was destined by all those around him to be a pastor. Charismatic, smart, and powerful. And with that type of ability and that confidence, he traveled to Georgia before it was a state, when it was a colony, to preach, to bring God to the colonies. It wasn't long before John Wesley found himself on a boat headed back in failure after being dismissed from his church. On that boat... There was a great storm and it nearly sank. And he was so afraid and so full of doubt. And he looked over and he saw a group of Moravians, another sect of the Christian faith, who were praying, who were calm, who were peaceful, who were trustful. And he asked, how do I not have that faith? And he doubted. He comes back to England. 
And his preaching style is dismissed by all those around him. His evangelistic, his, his focus to get out into the community was not a practice of the times. And he doubted. Am I called to do this? Am I supposed to be here? Am I even saved? A friend of his, a member of the Moravian movement himself, Peter Bowler, gave John these words of wisdom, this advice. He said, preach faith until you have it. And then, because you have it, you will preach it. Or in other words, move past and act as if you already had the faith, even in the midst of your doubt. And by the act of having the faith, you will find it. Or in other words, fake it until you make it. Wasn't long after that when John was invited to a Bible study and worship one evening on Aldersgate Street. And in the midst of the worship, he's hearing the words of Christ. And he has what he described as a strange warming of the heart. And he said, I knew I was saved. I knew my sin had been taken away and there was nothing that can change it. In other words, God loves me and there's nothing I can do about it. His journey of doubt pushed him to a place where God needed him to be. God did the work. John just held on. Whatever doubt you are experiencing today, whatever wilderness that you are in today, know that God will do the work. God's grace is in your life. He is not asking you to do anything but hold on. Today, let your prayer be, I believe. Help my unbelief. We are here for you as a church. I am here for you as a pastor. We are your community. You are not alone. Let this be a time of growth. A time of connecting with the God who has blessed us and blessed us abundantly. Let this wilderness be part of the journey, but it is not the destination. My prayers and my peace is with you today. We will now have a closing benediction. Just a reminder to all of you watching, if you're a member of the church or not, you can reach out to our church if you need assistance during this time. Again, our office phone number is 815-786-9243. Or if you'd like to email us with any concerns and or prayers, you can email us at ucssandwich at frontier.com. Please reach out to us with any concerns. We can get back to you as soon as possible. And Pastor Tom will be holding regular office hours and other events on Facebook like this, such as prayer groups and things of that nature. At this time, I'd like you all to bow your heads and pray with us as we pray one more time before we leave. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to have us all come together in a place of worship even though we're not all in the same place, we're all in the same mind, body, and spirit. Let us go out throughout this week to help each other, go closer one with each other, and go closer with God as we get through a very troubling time, but a time that we know that our faith and family can get us through in any means necessary. Please go and, please go and worship the Lord and act in his grace. With that I say, 